Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have with us Dan Kuhn. Dan, welcome to the show. Hi, Jeff. Uh, thanks for inviting me, and I'm glad to be here. Dan, I am glad to have you here. I've been following you, your work for a long time. When you first left the church, you uh, were writing under the screen name Joe Howard. Yeah, that was a uh, that was actually the name that probably most Scientologists knew me by because that was the name of a character that I played in one of the tech films, which was on TRs and uh, everyone like people who had done the uh, the TRs course saw that film over and over and over and over again. So they some people have told me they've seen the film a hundred times or more. So that was uh, the way most Scientologists knew me. Oh, I'm glad you told me that. I didn't know what the name Joe Howard was, having never seen the film. Well, so that's an inst instantly recognizable name. Yeah, uh, LRH had this idea, even back at St. Hill in the 60s, to make uh, films that would demonstrate TRs and metering and other aspects of, you know, Scientology auditing technology. And he... Um, when I joined the Sea Org in mid-1977, uh, it was at the Int base in La Quinta, and there was a fairly small crew, and uh, about a, a month after I arrived, the FBI raided the uh, church in uh, L.A., and he took off. He was gone for the next five months, but meanwhile, um, people began uh, building a, a film studio, and they began teaching acting classes, and people were starting to read books and this and that about filmmaking. And when LRH came back in January of 78, he just launched right into uh, making tech films, and I was part of that first one. So you were you, you were the star of the first tech film, and what, what was your role? What did L. L. Ron Hubbard want you to do? Well, the, the first film he shot was uh, about TRs, which are sort of the backbone of auditing. And he wanted to tell the story of a, of a, a field auditor who is getting terrible results on his PCs and they're blowing and they're uh, not winning in life and this and that. So it's a flap in the field and the, the org Qualsec starts running a, a special TRs course for field auditors. And this Joe Howard character becomes uh, is one of the people that's dragged in, and he gets put through the TRs. So, and, and, th and that's the way that LRH was demonstrating how you do proper TRs. And then at the end of the movie, he goes back and audits his PCs, and everything's doing great, and everyone's winning. And that's sort of the, the, the plot of the movie. Okay, now, Dan, two questions for our non-Scientology listeners who have, don't have a background. Can you briefly define what TRs are, what the word means? Yeah, TR stands for training routines, and it's basically the the protocols of communication that one uses when one is auditing a preclear, uh, someone who's, you know, you're counseling somebody, and TRs are sort of the way that you're supposed to uh, uh, just communicate to that person. Okay, that is, yeah, that's good. When I used to do sales calls, I guess you, by analogy, you could say we had TRs. You had to be, have a professional demeanor, listen to the client, pay attention, take notes. So it's, it's just that, that professional beingness that an auditor has with a preclear, the one being audited. Yeah. Uh, now, this I have to ask you. What is it like to be an actor who's being directed by L. Ron Hubbard? How is he as a director? Uh, well, that's interesting. Uh, the thing about this this whole tech films thing was that nobody knew a damn thing about filmmaking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, so, that's absolutely the case. I mean, yeah. you know, a couple guys had had run uh, you know home movie cameras, and uh, no one no one knew anything about it. And here we are out in the desert in La Quinta. And LRH had read some books, and he, you know, he made a couple of amateurish films back at Saint Hill, but he didn't really know much about it either. But he studied a lot, and so he was he was learning the terminology and learning how to properly shoot a movie. And we, uh, you know, various books called uh, like one of them was called the, the Five C's of Cinematography that started making the rounds, and then there was books on lighting, and so people started learning as fast as they could and kind of get up, getting up to speed, but nobody really knew what they were doing, and and the set uh, was often um, uh, how should we say it was it was there was a lot of 
because people didn't know what they were doing. There was a lot of upsets and a lot of screaming and yelling. And fortunately, because I was the, the, the main actor in the film, I had to get sleep at night. So otherwise my eyes would get red and that would be kind of mess up the shots the next day. So I at least always got sleep, but a lot of other people stopped getting a lot of sleep and it was pretty, um, you know, it, there was a lot of upsets on the, on the set. That's for sure. Let's put it that way. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Now, there's a picture out that shows um, L. Ron Hubbard wearing, you know, Western wear, cowboy clothes, with a megaphone in his director's chair. And uh, would he shout commands through the megaphone at the actors or people, or was it, or, or was that just a posed shot? That was a posed shot. He didn't need a megaphone. I mean, his voice he could project his voice uh, as far as he needed to. And so he, he didn't need a, uh, he didn't need a megaphone, but at the same time, I will say that he was pretty aware of what was going on. He was, he was like the eye of the hurricane. A lot of times it was like a hurricane in that studio. And I remember one time a new, a new recruit had just come onto the base and someone had brought him down to the studio to see what the, the shooting was going on, what it was like in the studio. And it happened to be, I happened to be down there, not particularly involved in anything that was happening right at that moment, but it was a complete mad whirlwind. And um, this guy walked in and he was just sort of dumbstruck by all the activity and all the randomity and the screaming and the yelling and everything. LRH noticed this guy and he walked over and shook his hand and say, hey, how you doing? Welcome here. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's always like this all the time and put the guy completely at ease. And then he went back to, you know, directing, getting set up for the next shot or something like that. But that was, uh, it was often like a lot of uh, random motion, a lot of uh, noisy orders and this and that. But once everything was set and once everything um, settled down and once he got everything done that he wanted done, he just sort of reverted back to this. He sort of had a, my my observation of was he sort of had this kind of default uh, tone level of, um, I guess you would say, kind of a serene cheerfulness. That was sort of, it, when I when I was around him, that was sort of his default tone level, and he could be volatile as hell. He could be yelling and screaming one moment, but once whatever it was he wanted handled was handled, he would go back to that kind of default tone level. Dan, when you were making the first tech film, was David Miscavige the cameraman? No, he was a, there was a cameraman and there was an assistant cameraman. He was a video cameraman. He and Mark Yeager were the guys that ran the, the uh, it was called the JVC, which is a video, a make of uh, video cameras. And LRH used, uh, we would shoot shots on video first and play them back when everything was okay, then we would shoot on film. I guess that was sort of a way to save film. But uh, DM was a video cameraman. Okay, so now, uh, L. Ron Hubbard liked cameras a lot. I understood he had a lot of cameras. Did was it? Did the Gold Base have very uh, you know expensive camera equipment? Uh, yeah, they had, we had the best 16 millimeter cameras at the time, film cameras, were, was the Aeroflex. And we had several yeah, no. Aeroflexes. And uh, I guess after, you know, uh, when everything moved to gold, uh, to the to the current gold base, then we got 35 millimeter cameras and stuff like that. But the, yeah, they had pretty good, he had pretty nice cameras. The Aeroflex he did nice. He liked, he liked to spend money on uh, equipment like that. Oh, yeah. Now, after the tech film, What's interesting, before the show we were talking, in 1970, 1979, you moved to the compilations unit? Yeah, that's right. So you're, tell us how your acting career ends in Scientology, and why do you get moved into compilations? Well, everybody on the base at that time had two posts. They had a, a, the regular post in the, in the org, and then they also had a job in the Cine org. So everyone was sort of double-hatted. And my, at the time, I was an auditor in the qualifications division. And um, interestingly, in 1978, LRH started a, uh, a compilations unit to help him put, put technical materials together. 
And one of the one of the um, one of the reasons why that came about was something that happened on the set one day. Uh, LRH came in and he was drilling me on some of my lines for um, for one of the one of the last shots when I'm auditing a person on Dianetics. And he um, said, "Okay, we'll go ahead and run through your line." And I gave him my line. And he said, "Wait a minute, that's not the correct command." And I said, "Well, yes, sir. It is the correct command. That's what's in the bulletin that's out that that teaches the R3R command. It's something like when uh, Dianetics is you, you know you have the person go back to the beginning of the incident. You sort of run through the incident and so on, and you do that a number of times. And that's the the theory is that that's kind of releases the charge on the incident. Well, in Dianetics at the time it was called Routine 3R, Routine 3 Revised, and that procedure the second time through the incident you would tell the guy to uh, go to the beginning of the incident and then scan through to the end of the incident and then tell the auditor what happened and I gave him the commands as were given in the HCOB at that time and he said no that's not the correct command I said well sir yes it is because and I had sort of altered my line to fit the HCOB and he had had a different line in the script so he called for the HCOB and uh, he realized, hey, this is not correct. This is the correct command is blah, whatever the, the, co the correct command was. And that was the beginning of what, uh, in a few months later, became new era Dianetics. So he. Oh, really? Yeah, that, that's, how that all, that's how that whole thing started to come about. In fact, in a, uh, about two weeks later, I was auditing PCs on uh, the pilot versions of new era Dianetics. With the with these different commands that he had he had changed after he started after he realized that the uh, you know the first commands were incorrect at any rate later that year he began um, helping he put together a compilations unit to start helping get all these Ned uh, new aerodynamics bulletins out and there was a lot of other things happening at the time uh, after while the tech films were going on. There was a whole project to uncover list one RSers and a list one RS. Uh, let me explain what that is all about. An RS is a rock slam, which is uh, a crazy movement of the needle. It just goes completely wild. And if you've ever seen one, they're they're unmistakable. At any rate, the, the whole point was he wanted to get people who were causing problems on the administrative lines, sort of get them parked off into the RPF. And he called for a list one project, which was called uh, list one was a um, a list from the 60s that had to do with a lot of uh, had subjects mentioned like Scientology organizations, L. Ron Hubbard, anything sort of Scientology related. So, so, so Dan, let me jump in here. Sure. Just because we do have non Scientologists, a, a list is a list of prepared questions that an auditor would ask a preclear. That's exactly right. And then, then uh, a rock slam is a needle phenomena. And if if I'm holding the cans and you're auditing me, and you see a rock slam, I'm called a rock slammer. Yeah. And what that indicates is that the person whose whose needle is rock slamming has a destructive intention or an evil purpose with respect to the subject of the question being discussed at the time. So say. If I'm auditing you and we're talking about David Miscavige and you have a rock slam, that means you're rock slamming on David Miscavige and you have an evil purpose or an evil intention with respect to David Miscavige, which so, uh, probably a lot of people would, would have that these days. <laughs> they would all be list one rock slammers. So a list one rock slammer is not a good thing in Scientology. It's a very bad thing. It means you have evil intentions. And so the... Uh, people were getting who rock slammed were getting sent to the RPF, the Rehabilitation Project Force, which is which is a, a you know a gulag, right? A, it's a reformation camp where you you know get rid of your evil purposes. That's exactly right. It's 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 basically the yeah it's the gulag, the Scientology's gulag. Well, what happened was the person running this List One project on the base had a misunderstood on what was considered a rock slam and she was sending almost everybody to the RPF 
Well, this this went on through the summer of 1978, and around August of 1978, LRH realized, wow, there's just too many people in the RPF. You know, even my messengers, some of my messengers are going to the RPF. What's going on here? And he looked into it and found out what had gone on and how this person had been miscalling rock slams and got her removed from the lines and sent her to the RPF. But then he, I guess he sort of undertook a, a way to kind of clean up these people who had been falsely RPF'd and were hung with these terrible uh, wrong indications of, you know, you're out to destroy Scientology, you're out to destroy L. Ron Hubbard, you're out to destroy everything that you've been working your life for. Well, he put together, he began to put together superpower. And so superpower was, was coming out around September of 1978, was being piloted. And... Um, RTRC just had a lot of work to do. He was sending down orders every day. He was also at the same time hatting them on how to do compilations, how to write HCOBs, how to write policy letters, how to take his orders and turn them into bulletins and courses and rundowns and things like that. By the way, I'll mention also that um, even back in the 1950s, LRH had no uh, must have that he had to be the only one writing bulletins and writing Dianetics and Scientology technology. He had people helping him from the earliest days of, uh, of Dianetics back in 1950. And he always had people helping him throughout the years. In fact, if you, if you can get a hold of an early, the, the original set of tech volumes, which was released in 1976, you can flip through those pages and you'll see names of many, many people besides L. Ron Hubbard who have written HCOBs or wrote it for him or assisted him in putting bulletins together. All that, of course, has been scrubbed in the latest uh, tech bottles, but um, he, he, he didn't have any, he had to be the only one writing stuff. That's yeah, imagine when you're running that big of a, of a program, you do, you do need help, but in the overall uh, mythology of Scientology, he had to become source yeah. of everything, and so uh, he becomes this myth, you know, mythological, larger than life character who created everything. Yeah. And now, in compilations, what interests me about compilations, because I come out of a, a Christian background in my youth, mm -hmm. and you know, religion religious scriptures have to be created. They don't fall out of the sky. Someone has to write them, someone has to edit them, compile them. You know, and, and most notably like the uh, New Testament was created at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Right. And that was a a big mess. If you're anyone who reads the history of that, there was a lot of quarreling and arguing over which books are we going to include in the canon of scripture. Yeah. And <clears throat> by analogy, you know, when I ask you what is Scientology, it would be something that L. Ron Hubbard would say, this is Scientology, this is not Scientology. But it really gets made in the compilations unit, does it not? The written version? For the most part. I mean, LRH wrote a lot of the stuff himself, and he wrote the books and so on. But uh, from 1978 onwards, many more bulletins were written by others than by L. Ron Hubbard himself, although he, for for a number of years, he saw everything and he approved it and he, you know, you know he went through it and said, no, this is wrong, right this way. And out of that, uh, that, that hatting, you might say, the training he gave to the people in the compilations unit, that sort of became... Uh, codified as the way you compile an HCLB in, uh, or a, a policy letter in Hubbard's name. And that those, all those uh, advices and uh, dispatches and memos and things like that became sort of uh, a hat for how to do compilations. Dan, let me get to a, a real important question. In uh, 2006, David Miscavige releases The Basics. Yeah. Jumping ahead of things, and he says that, uh, you know, like, the basic books were messed up, paragraphs were out of order, there were wrong semicolons. In fact, David Miscavige said to an audience, if you read Dianetics and didn't understand it, you weren't alone. And there was applause. 
Now, I'm, I'm, I'm watching this uh, announcement he made, and, and I thought, wait a minute, L. Ron Hubbard must have exercised considerable care over what he wrote, but Miscavige almost paints him like a doddering idiot who, you know, wrote it unedited, and then you had what, uh, SP transcriptionists is what Miscavige said? Yeah. You know, altering his works? Yeah. But you're you're giving a different picture of you know something that's methodical, careful, compiled, and you know I was a technical writer, so I understand assembling documents, document custody, overview, editing, you know that process. Oh yeah. So is there a, is there a disconnect between Miscavige's claim that all these books had to be rewritten and that Hubbard was really that sloppy to allow SP transcriptionists to screw up everything? Yeah, I mean. Miscavige is full of shit on that point. The things, the, the point is that one story I heard was that the the copyrights were set to expire, and in order to renew a copyright, there apparently there has to be a certain amount of changes made in the thing to, re, to be able to renew the copyright. So he just went through and started nitpicking and taking out semicolons and this, that, and the other thing. And that that's uh, that's one story I read. I don't know. I didn't hear about that while I was working on the, on those books. In fact, the last five years or so, I was I worked in marketing after I left compilations. And Jeff Hawkins and I and my wife, Mariette, we're the ones that put together what became, uh, what came out as the basics after several years after we both, after we all left. Yeah, and what's interesting to me, Dan, is David Miscavige represents himself as chairman of the board Religious Technology Center his job supposedly is to ensure the ecclesiastical purity of the Scientology religion. So he was selling very expensive Scientology basics books up until he said, oops, they're SP transcription issue, you have to get the new books. Right. And, and, I've, and, and, and me as a consumer, I'd say, wait a minute, you assured me that these books were ecclesiastically pure for the last 25, 30 years, and now you're saying they're not? Isn't that deception? Isn't that a bait and switch? <laughs> I know people who bought sets of libraries and right before the basics were announced, and they were so upset with the church that the church actually exchanged the books at no cost, which is rare. And, and at the same time the basics came out, there were groups of Sea Org members going to the homes of public Scientologists saying, we need all your old books, we're going to pulp them. Yeah, I read stories about that. People going in, just breaking into their house and just taking their books while they're not even home. It's just... Well, so was was this a move on Miscavige's part to revise history, erase the past, get rid of the older books? Probably. I mean, yeah, although I think he just he, can, he just does stuff because he can. And he can he can throw his weight around just because he can, and people some people listen to him, other people who get tired of listening to him leave. Now you worked with David Miscavige for many years. Many years, because um, in in uh, in RTC or David Miscavige was the final approval terminal for all technical uh, material, so. I, I worked with him closely for the 10 years that I was in RTRC from 1987 to 1997. And uh, yeah, everything, I had just countless meetings with the guy and he would go over things and he would either okay it or not okay it or he'd have rejects on whatever. So he, he was very, uh, uh, had a very micro managerial style with regards to that. Now, Dan, you worked, you said for RTC from 1987 to 1997. So after Mr. Hubbard dies in January of 1986, Miscavige becomes the final arbiter of Scientology of saying what Scientology is and isn't. That's right. And, you know, what was, it, in the aftermath of, of uh, Mr. Hubbard's death, what is Miscavige's emphasis on in terms of the tech? Uh, I mean, does, well, he, does he do? Does he begin to do things immediately when Mr. Hubbard dies? No, there was a about a two-year power struggle between Miscavige and Pat Broker.
he and his wife, Annie Broker, were the people that were with Hubbard uh, at the end, him and, and a few other uh, other people. But they were the two main people that, that looked after him in the last years of his life. And when, um, when LRH died, it became then going to be a fight between DM and Pat Broker, who was going to run the church. And Pat Broker allegedly had uh, the upper OT level materials, and Miscavige didn't have those. The, uh, Pat had them locked away in a secret location. And um, eventually, Miscavige got a hold of the materials, and after that, uh, Broker had no more leverage, so he was out of there very shortly after that. And Miscavige then was fully running a show. That didn't occur until around spring of 1987. So it was over a year's worth of uh, a power struggle there. You know, and that's one of the big un unanswered questions about Scientology. When Pat Broker leaves, he just disappears. Now we know that David Miscavige, Miscavige had him followed for 25 years by two private investigators. Yeah. This speaks to Miscavige's personality is that threatened by someone who's gone for 25 years and um nobody knew that he was being followed apparently except for uh marty rathman yeah and so once once pat is gone and you know the leadership is, question is settled what becomes the emphasis in rtc on compilations well, uh, the first thing that happens is Miscavige has, had been in L.A. the whole time. It's author services. He comes up to the base and he cleans house, meaning uh, some of the RTC people, Religious Technology Center people, had sided with Pat Broker, and some of the people in Int Management had sided with Miscavige. Well, Miscavige came up and he got rid of all the people that had been uh, siding with Broker. After that point, he basically started, uh, the emphasis became to just put out new academy levels and put out a new student hat, sort of basically start at the bottom of the training side, auditor training side of Scientology on the bridge. And the, the first check sheets we did were uh, academy check sheets and the student hat and things like that, just sort of basic, basic auditor training materials. Yeah. Now, is, during this time, is, is you notice uh, Miscavige, David Miscavige has been noted for being violent, for being physically abusive toward his staff. When's the first time you noticed that he was volcanic, temperamental? Um, it, it didn't happen overnight. When he got back to the base in 87, things were pretty OK. Things got a little bit uh, heated now and then. He was, you know, he was demanding, but he wasn't abusive and violent that I particularly recall. Um, the, the, the first thing that I, when he really blew his lid, was on August 10th, 1990, when there was a big flood. It was a, like a hundred year event and it was uh, totally flooded the base and the mountain was washing across Highway 79 into the G's and uh, it was a complete catastrophe. That dinner, after dinner that that night or that 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 afternoon, uh, Miscavige called the whole base together. All the gold staff were stood up in front of the the dining room, and every all the int and the other orgs were sort of in the back. And he came up and he blasted them. He just he was frothing, literally frothing like a madman at a, for at least a half an hour at the gold crew, just swearing them, you know, swearing up side one down, up one side and down the other, and uh, ripping them, ripping all, you know, he blamed the entire catastrophe on the gold crew, which was, of course, insane because he's insane. And at that point, that's when he really started to, uh, like, well, Ron Miscavige, his father, talks about that's the, that's the turning point. Things never got better on the base after that. Well, you know, it's interesting in Scientology, the idea that a, per, a person or a group pulls things in. So, gold, you guys were had such power that you could pull in a hundred year flood to destroy the base. Yeah, exactly. But see, that's Scientology thinking. There always has to be somebody to blame. 
And I would so the say, base, I the would ba- say that's the, David Miscavige's thinking. Like I'm, a, I was a Scientologist. I didn't think that. I thought, oh. man, it's raining. Like it's really raining cats and dogs. The only one who thought that was David Miscavige. The seer cleans up the base. Life gets back to normal. Well, they, they, he sort of put them all on a very rigorous boot camp to try to make them, re, you know, quote unquote, real Sea Org members, and it was a complete travesty of that. Uh, eventually, yeah, things get cleaned up and things get put back together, and, and uh, but life sort of definitely goes downhill after that. That's for sure. And now, w- when is the genesis? Of, uh, you mentioned earlier that superpower was cr- created by L. Ron Hubbard as a way to remedy Sea Org members who had been falsely declared list one rock slammers and RPF'd. Yeah. What is the genesis of the golden age of tech that David Miscavige rolled out in '96? Okay. Like, what is the why? What the why behind that? Why was it needed? In 1995, he was spending a lot of time at uh, down at Flag. Uh, you know, Miss CSing Lisa McPherson and just sort of messing things up down at Flag. And the, um, he, you know, he, he was looking in, uh, they had look-in systems where someone could observe the auditors and the PCs in session, and he just wasn't happy with the results that the Class 12s and the other auditors at Flag were getting. So he began uh, meddling with that, and that was really the, what became uh, the following year, the Golden Age of Tech. How does the three swing floating needle come into effect? That was his uh, alteration of something L. Ron Hubbard had said. Uh, well, let me back up a bit. In 1978, uh, I think in July, LRH wrote a, a bulletin where he defined what a floating needle is. And he says it's a, basically it's a rhythmic sweep of the dial at a slow, even pace of the needle. In 1979, uh, RTRC was working on revising the meter books and updating the meter books. Now, there's four books that, that talk about how to operate an e-meter and the different drills you do and things like that. In one of the comments he made, he just sort of further clarified what an FN is. And he says it swings back and forth, back and forth, rhythmically or something like that. I forget the exact words. Uh, now, Dan, Dan, let me jump in for our listeners who have never been on an e-meter. Mm-hmm. In Scientology, a floating needle is a good thing. So, if I'm on, if you're auditing me again, and I and I have a floating needle, what does that mean to you as an auditor that my needle's floating? What that means is the needle is sort of just. Uh, idling sort of back and forth it's not being it's not reacting to anything that you're saying or anything i'm saying and it sort of indicates that uh any upset or any charge or any trauma has been released on that particular subject and that sort of signifies uh as far as the meter is concerned that that section of the auditing session can be ended safely so that's when the session ends. Your needle's floating. I'd like to indicate that the session has ended. That type of thing. Something like that, yeah, or the process, okay. or whatever. You, know, you can you can get many floating needles throughout the course of a session, but then you always want to end the session on a floating needle, which means that, that the person is going to be feeling good and what you set out to accomplish, you accomplished. Things like that. Good. I appreciate the clarification. Now, the floating needle is so central in Scientology. One could almost call it a sacrament. Yeah, uh, you know, right. the, because, right. because if you don't end a session with a floating needle, there's a problem. Definitely. And what happened was uh, David Miscavige began insisting that the needle had to swing a certain amount of times for it to be a valid floating needle. And that caused so much havoc throughout Scientology, starting at Flag, but it spread quickly to the whole rest of the Scientology world. And the guy is just a meddler. And uh, if you wanted to pick one one thing you could do to destroy Scientology and destroy auditing results, it would be to mess up the definition of a floating needle, which he did. In 2000, there was an actually uh, that bulletin from 1978 was re, was issued as a revision with uh, that statement in there about how many times it had to swing, and that just that just caused so much trouble for people. I mean, really, really ruined a lot of people's cases, 
ruined their bank accounts, ruined auditors. Uh, it was a mess, and I, I think it was intentional on his part. Why would you say that? Because having worked with the guy for – I knew him for all 27 years I was in the Sea Org. Um, at, at the end, particularly from about 1990 on, he gave every – evidence of being a sociopathic personality and i'm convinced that that's his he, he doesn't mean anyone any good in scientology I, I i certainly believe that i've talked to many many people who left the church because of the three strings floating needle many publics who were sitting there waiting for the auditor to call it but the auditor's uptight the auditor's upset they're and and people have to realize when a session in the church is always videotaped it's it's being filmed. Yeah. And the auditor, he or she is going to be in big trouble if they don't call the correct floating needle because there's somebody watching the needle movement. There's cameras watching the whole thing. And it tends to upset people and they leave. They, they don't feel they got a good session. Dan, as to David Miscavige's qualifications, technically, I mean, what has he been trained to? He's not... Has he, how much auditor training did he have? How much tech training did he have? I believe he trained up to class four auditor at St. Hill in the 70s. And as far as I know, that's it. I don't think he ever had any CS training. He certainly wasn't qualified to declare Lisa McPherson clear, which is the, uh, the indication that then sometime later led to her freaking out and, and tragically dying at the Fort Harrison Hotel. Uh, he had no he had no uh, authority to do anything even remotely like that. In fact, I'll tell you a story. Um, Meryl Mayo, who was David Mayo's wife, and David Mayo was the senior CS International, meaning the highest technical person in Scientology for many years. His wife was a class 12 auditor, but she wasn't trained as a CS. One day, she... Um, she CS'd a folder, like the, the pre-clear she was going to audit had to have some change made in, 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 the, in the, the case supervision directions for the next session. She made that change and went ahead and did the session, and everything turned out fine. LRH found out about that, and he wrote down to David Mayo, said, and he said, if any auditor uh, who's not trained to CS, CS is a folder, they're going to lose all their certificates from here on out till the end of time, and they're to be removed from auditor training. Anyway, it was a very uh, severe punishment. He, he, he didn't want people holding the, uh, pretending to be CSs when they weren't CSs. Well, David Miscavige blithely declares this woman clear and ends up with a mess that, uh, that, that happened afterwards, a real tragedy. Oh, indeed, and, and some definitions. The Scientology auditor has a supervisor that's called a case supervisor. That is, they review the auditor's work. That's and they, they direct, and he's like the, uh, the auditor's handler. He directs them on what to do. He corrects them if they make an error. He's their friend. He and, he and the auditor work for the benefit of the pre-clear and the person being audited. And, and it's, it's like a sort of a, 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 an exterior set of eyeballs on what's occurring in the auditing to make sure that everything goes as, you know, according to plan. So this case supervisor does what is called programming the case? Yeah, and he directs what actions to be taken. He directs the PC's progress up the bridge and what's the best way to make the most, um, the best use of their auditing time and so on, yeah. And so you have David Miscavige, who's a class four auditor way down there. Within the context of Scientology, David Miscavige is incredibly unqualified to be anything other than a class four auditor. And yet he wants to tell the senior technical terminals what Scientology is and isn't. Yeah, and there's a term in Scientology called no best, K-N-O-W-E-S-T. <laughs> and, and David Miscavige... You and I may know well, but David Miscavige knows best. So really, when his word becomes law, he can just say what the technology is, and therefore you need three swings of the needle. Exactly. That's exactly right. And people buy it. Although, like I said, like I said earlier, some people don't buy it and they leave. 
Well, and, and that brings us to my next question. What caused you to leave the Church of Scientology, Dan? Um, at the time, I was working in marketing, and things were getting progressively worse. Uh, this was, I literally, I left literally about two weeks before the whole was instituted. So I got out just in time because I'm sure that I would have been in there at, at some point. At any rate, things were getting in gold. I was in gold then. Things were just getting bad. There were group seances being held where... Now, what, now what is a group seance? Okay, the group seance was all the gold staff, all the gold crew would be gathered into the... Um, into the dining area and be set up for like a staff meeting and uh you know all the tables were removed and all the chairs were set up and you know people were all sitting sitting in a big large group and uh the the, the commanding officer would get up and say well we you know we got to get this org together we got to turn ourselves into a team i'm going to call up people who are who are uh standing and, you know, blocking COB's intention and they're destructing, they're destructive and they're not executing his orders. And I want them to talk about what they've, you know, confessed their sins to the whole group. And that was called the group seance. The, the idea being that magically, as though speaking to uh, the spirits in the other world, gold would, would, would miraculously turn around and become a shining example of a on-source productive organization. Of course, it was just a, a bunch of crap, and people were just uh, stood up there and, and pilloried basically by the rest of the crew. So, and if it, you if you were if you were standing up there confessing your sins, people in the group would be yelling at you. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, how, it, you know, you you you'd say something and then say, "Well, what you know, what did you really do? How how many times did you do that?" And blah 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 blah. And it was sort of became it became pretty ugly. To be honest, were there like a hundred people in the room, or how many people would be in a group seance? Oh, let's see. The gold crew around that time was probably uh, 350, 400. It was probably 400 people. So, an individual man or woman would be up there in front of the group being yelled at by three, four hundred people. Well, not and, everyone was yelling because uh, but, other people were yeah. probably like, I might be next, but some people were sort of. Uh, you know, uh, Miscavige sort of likes to establish the uh, the identity of a, a tough Sea Org member, and that's someone who does basically what he does. So if some people go into his, that identity, they sort of adopt that as a, as a survival mechanism, and they start acting like they think he would act in that situation. So some of those people would say, "Yeah, well, what do you? Why, why did you do that? You know, and and what's what? What other crimes do you have? What else did you do? That kind of stuff." It certainly wasn't everybody, but there were a few people who were more vocal than others. Dan, did it ever occur to you, just in a moment of maybe, you know, uh, that you're there in a Seorg uniform in a folding metal chair in this insane group seance? Yeah. Where, where people are being belittled, invalidated, screamed at, that, that this was insane? Oh, listen. That's that's sort of what prompted me to to, to get the get the hell out of uh, get the hell out of Dodge. I mean, I was one of the the little E's at one time because I was uh, Jeff Hawkins and I and a couple other people were working on the whole marketing of the books and lectures, which would come out several years later. So we were definitely in the firing line of cutting across COB's orders and sabotaging what he was trying to get done. So we were we were two of the real. Uh, punching bag for the rest of the rest of the crew now did you did you uh, route out of the sea org or did you blow did you just escape or well what happened was uh on the sunday before christmas that year 2003 um we were given uh christmas shopping time you could go to the store down the at the time we weren't living on the base we were living in town in apartments and we were given the opportunity two and a half hours to go buy Christmas presents for our family that were going to be mailed the next day, and they wouldn't arrive in time anyway because Christmas is only about three or four days later. At any rate, I took that opportunity to uh, get on my bicycle and ride off, right off into the sunrise. Uh, I'd stayed up all night working on a submission on the Phoenix Lectures, which was part of the books and lectures um, whole package. Went to bed tried to get some sleep, couldn't sleep, got up at nine o'clock, uh, got, got dressed and put on my, uh, got my backpack and uh, rode off, 
And that was it. It was a, it was the cleanest, simplest disconnection from Scientology to, of any story that I've ever heard of. Now, now fast forward, uh, maybe I don't know the the time frame, but you get together with Mariette. Yeah, uh, Mariette was uh, Mariette Lindstein is uh, she was working on the books and lectures with Jeff and I and two other people. She ended up in the hole. And people were accusing her of having an out 2D with me. We were both married to other people, uh, although we we didn't, and that just our affair didn't really start till after she blew. She got uh, she started act. She was in the hole, started acting crazy in, in a plan to get sent off the base down to the PAC RPF. So three months later, she gets sent down to the PAC RPF, and from there she blew. And then uh, we connected up, and we sort of began a life together after that. Now you live in Sweden. You and Marriott live in Sweden. Yeah, she was. She's Swedish. She grew up in uh, Hamstad here on the west coast of Sweden, and uh, we moved here in 2011 after spending several years with my family in the in the Bay Area up in near San Francisco. So life goes on, can go on very successfully after the Sea Org, and that's an important thing for for Sea Org members to realize uh, if they're lurking, listening to the show, is you can have a very successful, happy life once you leave. Uh, because in the CR, they'd like to tell you you're nothing. You can't, you can't survive out there in the WOG world. In fact, Marriott's been very successful in her literary endeavors. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. She, um, yeah, the standard line at the base from Miscavige was that if you, if you leave the Sea Org, you're going to get cancer and you're going to be flipping burgers at McDonald's, and that's, <laughs> that's the sum total of your success. Cancer. You're going to get cancer and flip burgers at McDonald's. Yeah, that's, and then you're going to die, and that's it. That's it, man. So better better buckle down and get your stats up. At any rate, uh, yep. um, in, in 2000, um, when was it? Around Whenever Lawrence Wright was researching his book, Going Clear, Scientology and the Prison of Belief, um, he contacted Mariette to get some information because she had worked uh, with David Miscavige as her direct senior for several years. Well, she be, he, Lawrence Wright began telling her, listen, you need to speak out about these abuses. And she decided she was going to speak out. She hadn't said anything. We hadn't, I'd, I'd done some other work for other people, but she hadn't uh, really done much of anything. She just wanted to leave the whole thing behind her and just get on with her life. Anyway, she began uh, instead of writing a, a memoir or an, autobiog an autobiography, she wrote a, a novel, a fiction book called The Cult on Fog Island. Hmm. And just two weeks ago, that book won the prize as the, the best uh, thriller of the year uh, by, a, uh, by the organization that kind of forwards Scandinavian crime and thriller novels. So well, what a tremendous, a tremendous accomplishment! Or congratulations to her. Yeah, thanks. I'll, 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 I'll spread that to her. Yeah, it was her first book. She'd never written. She had uh, some help from uh, a good friend from her earlier days in Sweden who helped her with the editing and so on. But yeah, and it's really become a, a big success here. Her second book is now out, and that's on the top of the bestseller list. And She's now selling the books to other countries. She's got a deal in Poland. She's got a deal in uh, Norway. She's got a deal in the Netherlands. And there's German publishers bidding on the book right now. So eventually, uh, hopefully, somebody in, in uh, the U.S. will wake up and, and grab this book because I think a lot of people who are uh, Scientology watchers or former Scientologists will be interested to, to read the story. Oh, I would love to read the book. In talking about books, uh, Dan, I'm holding in my hands a book called Ruthless by a fellow named Ron Miscavige Sr. Never heard of it. <laughs> and I also know the church put up a hate site. Oh, David Miscavige put up a hate website on you because you had something to do with the book. But basically, how did Ruthless come about? Well... Steve Hall and I, uh, I think you've met Steve Hall. He and I had, uh, when Ron and his wife Becky blew in 2012, 
uh, after he got in contact with us, both Steve and I had been on Ron's ass to, to write a book, man. You could write a book. He would write a book, write a book. And he didn't want to do it. He didn't want to do it. He just didn't want the hassle. He didn't want to do it. I said I would help him with it. At any rate, once his daughters disconnected from him, he said, this has got to stop. I've got to speak out. He realized he had a responsibility to, as the father of the leader of the church, to do something about this. So I happened to be in Los Angeles at the time uh, with Mariette visiting uh, her son and his family. And I flew back to Wisconsin, where Ron lives. And I took my little recorder. We sat down for three or four days, and we just talked all day long. I got about 20 or 30 or 50 hours of material. And I went back to Sweden here and wrote a draft. And then we uh, came back uh, the next January with a, a finished draft. We polished it up, and then we began shopping it around, and St. Martin's picked it up. Yeah, and the book, and the book is tremendous. And uh, people haven't read it. I really urge you to read it. It's called uh, Ruthless, um, and it's by Ron Miscavige Sr. Now, the subtitle is what really interested me. Give give, their, give our listeners the uh, subtitle, and I really want to know how did you pick that subtitle? It uh, well, the subtitle is Scientology, my son David Miscavige, and me, and basically that was that's what the book is about. It's about Ron's experience getting involved in Scientology, getting the family involved in Scientology. It focuses on his son because his son is the the notorious leader of the Church of Scientology. And it's also Ron's memoir of himself. So that it was just an obvious, that's what the subtitle had to be. I think, I think it was a, just a great subtitle. And it became a New York Times bestseller, which is tremendous for Ron Miscavige and, and, and you to work on a New York Times bestseller. Because I notice in passing that the re-release of Battlefield Earth by L. Ron Hubbard yeah. has, t has tanked. It went nowhere. <laughs> I can't imagine why. And they're getting ready to release what are his next sci-fi book, and that will be dead on arrival. And uh, so, so there's quite you know quite a demand for these these memoirs, these narratives of, of people who are really in the belly of the beast, like you were. Do you have a plan to write your own book? No, my story, I, I just don't think my story is that interesting. I'd, I'd much rather help other people tell their stories. I, I'm sort of not interested in myself. I'm more interested in what other people had to say. And, you know, I think we've basically covered my story in this first hour. And, you know, if there's, uh, if we do further interviews, we can uh, discuss more about things. But uh, I'm, I'd rather write other people's books for them, help them with their books. Well, that's a great service to provide because not everyone can write a book. My final question as we wrap up here, uh, Dan, what do you see ahead in the next year for the Church of Scientology and David Miscavige? The next year? Yeah. I think it's more just, you know, more down stats, more people leaving, uh, you know, more fundraising, more, uh, it's, it's sort of just the same until some court case or something tips the scales and or the IRS finally grows a pair and starts to look into what's really going on, I think that uh, if things are going to pretty much just sort of continue on their, you know, their uh, their death slide. Yeah, and more of the same doesn't sound like a happy place to be if you're in the Church of Scientology. No. More IAS fundraising, more contributing to the ideal orgs, more security checks, whatever. Yeah, there's a lot better things you can do with your time than, than be involved with the Church of Scientology. Well said. Dan, maybe on the next show we could get into details of the Lisa McPherson era, because that's, I think, a story that's very important. Yeah, a, a tragedy that's very important, that's for sure. It, and it is, and it was a defining moment in Scientology, and I always appreciate having people on my podcast who were there. So thank you, and for Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you for listening, and as always, we'll be in very good touch.